Yeah. Okay, so this is an overview of SATCOM, satellite communications. As you know, the field is very, very broad and it covers hundreds of things. So I'll, uh, it's going to be a, a snapshot of a few items that I felt were interesting. I had a question? I'm going to start with questions. Are you going to talk about uh, the Starlink? Yes. Okay. That's one of the examples. Yes. Yeah. Let me uh, make sure the screen. Okay. Well, I don't think we're sharing the giant screen. Yes. Oh, so SpaceX. So we're sharing now. How do I advance the slides? So with the mouse. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 So this is a, an outline of, of some of the items I'm going to cover. First, an introduction on the connectivity, which is in a way the op the objective of of SATCOM is to provide connectivity worldwide. <clears throat> then, whoops, it's moving by itself. Anyway, okay. So we're going to. Just talk about the basics of the orbits and the basic principles of SATCOM. Then a little bit on the evolution, advances in technology and, and their impact. Uh, talk about some of the current satellites, the high throughput satellites and the traditional satellites. And then we go into the more modern things, which are, which are the LEOs and the MEOs. <clears throat> so I have a few examples where I cover, we talk about Starlink, Iridium, Astranis and Kuiper. <clears throat> Uh, and I, I have a few slides that cover the issue of the overcrowding of the space uh, and specifically how to handle space debris, which seems to be a concern for many people. And at the end, just cover some of the uh, future items. <clears throat> so first, talk about the uh, internet penetration to date. So I, th I, th I thought this was an interesting plot. This is from the ITU. So this is the number of internet users in, in billions here on the vertical axis. And this is the time, this is 2023. And this is the percentage of internet users, 70%, which I think is pretty high, but as you know, 30% of the population is several billion still. So, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, <clears throat> and, and some of these, uh, new constellations that are being deployed and developed like uh, Kuiper and Starlink, they're trying to provide a service to the gap of those, those people that don't have internet connection. And, and again, again that's, that's the objective of some of these new networks. <clears throat> this this plot, plot shows the mobile phone penetration. This is how, how many, uh, what percentage of people have phone in the world, and this was updated as 2022. And it's, it's developing, it's, it's, uh, these diagrams are based first on, on geographical areas, so here, Africa, Americas, Arab states, Pacific, CIS in Europe. So the, the mobile phone penetration is somewhere between 60 and 93%. And uh, for the low income countries, it's more like in the 50, 49, thereabouts. <clears throat> And these are the, the um, least developing countries. <clears throat> so uh, again, this is one of the items that the uh, the future of SATCOM is trying to to cover that gap for people that don't have communications. <clears throat> uh, this is another plot of showing the mobile phone penetration. Um, so this, these lines here you see here, these, these are the fixed telephone subscriptions. I remember when I first started into this business several years ago, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the task was to achieve phone penetration in different parts of the world. And at that time we were talking about 10%, 15%, 20%. Those, those were the objectives to trying to, to achieve those numbers. And those were the fixed lines. But as you can see here, the fixed telephone lines are no longer the big thing, but the mobile phones, these are the ones that, that have really uh, expanded and exploded in terms of penetration worldwide. 
I keep on moving in the wrong direction. And now this uh, this plot here is interesting because the question is, uh, okay, we're gonna provide, or we uh, are going to provide internet to the underdeveloped countries and people that have uh, low income and so on. But the question is, is it affordable to those people? And that's usually the big task, the big challenge. <clears throat> so this plot shows, um, on the on the left hand side, so developed countries, not not uh, least developing countries, and the ones in between with the three colors, and the percentage of um, uh, the, the broadband penetration. <clears throat> and this one here, which I think is very interesting, shows the broadband prices as a percentage of the gross national income per capita, because that's that's really the item. It's not like, can people afford $100 a month? But in the US, you can, but in, in some of the jungle in Africa, they can't. So the question is, what percentage of the gross uh, national income uh, does it cost to these people? So here you see the uh, uh, the number of countries where where the, the GNI is, is, uh, is achievable. So. Uh, and, and when you ask a question about Starling, uh, and, and I'm gonna show some numbers there, but Starling is not their cheap. It's like hundred bucks a month or so. So for many people, it's a great thing, people that live in the rural areas. But if you go to the Amazon in Brazil and ask somebody to pay a hundred dollars a month for, for internet, they're gonna say, well, hundred dollars a month is, is my monthly income. So <clears throat> there's no way. <laughs> So there's still a lot of uh, room to go. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about SATCOM in general, <clears throat> the, the basic principles. So there is uh, three different types of orbits that, that we talk about. The most common one until recently was the geostationary orbit, so the geo, that has an altitude of roughly 43,000 kilometers. This is from the center of the Earth to the uh, or orbit of the, of the, of the satellite. <clears throat> or 36,000 kilometers altitude from the surface. The MEOs or medium Earth orbit are roughly between five to 20,000 kilometers. These are shown over here. And the LEOs, which are the big thing these days, they're only a few hundred kilometers or maybe a few thousand kilometers high. <clears throat> and these are shown over here. So this scale would be very, it's very, very close to the surface. <clears throat> So the geostationary orbit, it, it's again, it used to be the most uh, used orbit and it has some very special characteristics. It's the geostationary orbit is in the equatorial plane and it, it's geosynchronous, meaning that the, the period of rotation is exactly the same as the sidereal day, 23 hours, 56 minutes. So what's, what, why is it like that? Or what, why, what's the advantage of the satellite? If you're positioned in any place on the surface of the Earth, the satellite on the geostationary orbit appears to be fixed, or pretty much fixed. And that's that's what enables these satellite antennas or VSAT antennas to point at the satellite and basically you point them once and that's it. <laughs> because the Earth and the, the satellite move exactly the same uh, rate. <clears throat> um, so it's still, if, one of the most uh, used and, and demanded orbits, <clears throat> and, and it's used for broadcasting networks and you name it. <clears throat> it's a very coveted real estate uh, because it's only one circle around the earth that has that characteristic. So this circle is full of satellites. And of course there is a battle for, I want a position in the orbit, but it turns out that the US has 30 positions and, and Panama has one position. So it's, it's, a, it's a battle of a, uh, a diplomatic battle for the, for the uh, orbital positions. <clears throat> there is hundreds of satellite position in the geostationary orbit. And as I mentioned, there's some battles. <clears throat> uh, you cannot get too, too close, not because the satellites are going to collide, but because there is interference. So if you put, have the satellite here and another one, one degree apart, and they all, they use the same frequency band. There's going to be interference from one to the other. So there's only so so much uh, reuse of the orbit that you can do. 
So the interference and the limited spectrum are the issues. Now, the, the geostationary orbit has one downside. That's the main downside, <clears throat> is the propagation delay. Since the orbit is 40, 43,000 kilometers away from, from the Earth, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, electromagnetic waves take about an eighth of a second, 125 milliseconds, to go from the surface of the Earth to the orbit, and then another one come back. So you have a quarter of a second De delaying propagation. When you send a signal and it comes back, it's a quarter of a second. <laughs> and that's what, uh, you know, in the 10, 15 years ago, some of the long distance phone calls were run over satellites and you could actually tell that the person was taking some time to respond. And you can see it also in the news when the CNN, when the remote area is being interviewed by the anchor, the anchor asks a question, and the guy is sitting there, and then two seconds later, he starts talking. It's because it's usually also with satellite, a couple of satellite links. So this is what the geostationary orbit looks like. This is a plot that I got probably a couple of years old or so. So it looks pretty crowded, as you can see. So this, this plot shows each satellite what the location is and what band it uses and so on. <clears throat> but if we think this is crowded, Wait till you see the Leo's constellation that has tens of thousands of satellites. So this is nothing. <laughs> These satellites, even though they, in this diagram, they appear to be very close to each other, they're a few hundred kilometers away from each other. <laughs> so some of the main applications of satellites is broadcasting, networking, uh, navigation, and I'm not going to talk about GPS. GPS is a, the whole thing on itself, and it's, it's a beautiful application for satellites. By the way, there was a, a seminar on GPS just a couple of weeks ago. Anybody took it? It was, it was very, very interesting. It, it pretty, it, 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 they got pretty much into the details of the technical aspects of GPS, and it's, it's very uh, amazing. <clears throat> Remote sensing, uh, Earth observation, that means like weather satellites or spooky satellites or whatever you want to call them, is, is a very uh, important application for satellites. <clears throat> and, as we, and as we've been talking about the globalization of the internet is one of the big things these days. Uh, mobility for both for aero, land and maritime is also a big, big, big time. For example, the uh, in-flight uh, Connectivity and entertainment, as called, it's a big industry that's that's driving a lot of the the market in SATCOM. <clears throat> and the Internet of Things is also one item that's being developed right now and implemented. And I have a couple of slides on that. Now, I, I'm not going to talk about defense and military application because, as, as some of you are already involved with that, that's one of the big big areas for SATCOM. For, for defense, for spooky, for uh, monitoring, for defense, and all kinds of things. <clears throat> and uh, But it's not my specialty, and also, again, it's a, it's a very uh, specialized area. <clears throat> so what, what, are, what is happening in the market these days? <clears throat> for one, there's, there's a lot of consolidation of the traditional satellite providers. <clears throat> As you probably know, the SES, which is a European company that owns like 50 satellites thereabouts, they uh, acquired O3B, which was a, uh, a MEO satellite constellation developed, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago or so, uh, started by Mr. Greg Weiler, and uh, <clears throat> it was eventually bought by SES. <clears throat> Udelsat just recently announced that they're basically taking control of one web, which is another one of these big constellations that started several years ago. <clears throat> and the big announcement that came out just a few months ago that SES is gonna acquire Intelsat. And this is like the two big ones. <clears throat> the, the, the largest operators of the satellite are going to basically become one. So between the two of them, and, and the, the, the purchase price is somewhere in the $3 billion range. So when they when they work together, once it's approved, they're going to have roughly 100 geo satellites plus the MEO satellites from OTB, from O3B. <clears throat> the other consolidation that happened, I think, like a year ago or so, Viasat acquired Inmarsat, which was kind of a surprise because Viasat 
in my mind, was a much smaller company than in my set, but the, the small company bought the big one. <clears throat> and Viasat has become a, ma a major player. They went from being basically a hardware developer product <clears throat> company to um, went into the satcom business and now they're offering satellite services. Mm -hmm. You can buy satellite internet from Viasat for your home. <clears throat> And so the other thing in the market that's happening is the move to, to Leo constellations. And uh, one of them is called the Lightspeed, which is, is still being developed. This is a Telesat Canada that has decided to go into the Leo world. They are not chasing the, uh, the consumers, but mostly the corporations for, for um, internet connections. Starling, as we were talking about, is chasing the consumer, but, but also the business customers. And Kuiper, which is the Amazon competition to Starling, is going to start very soon. I think some of the, the launches are going to happen in the next few months. And uh, it's going to be a big, a big thing also. <clears throat> but here we're talking about tens of thousands of satellites between these two guys. <clears throat> compared to a hundred geos. So all of a sudden, when you talk about a satellite uh, costing $300 million or so, one of these big ones, now the Starling and Kuiper satellites may cost, including the, the satellite and the launch and all that, maybe a couple of million there So it's a very big difference between one and the other. <clears throat> There's uh, happening also the connection of the satellite to cell services. There are some cell phones that now can connect directly to satellites. That's uh, starting right now, and you're gonna see a lot of that <laughs> happening. And um, as I mentioned before, there's these, uh, this, the super, the big, big geo satellites are called high throughput satellites. They, they, uh, they have some special characteristics we're gonna show in a, in a, in a slide. But ex two examples of those are Hughes and Viasat. Very sophisticated, very heavy, very big satellites with a lot of capacity. And uh, and one company that I chose to highlight just as an example is a company called Astranis. I don't know if anybody has heard of it. It's a small company that, that contrary to everybody going into the Leo world, these people said, no, we're going to build a small satellite, but we're going to put it in the geo orbit. So, I th which I think has many advantages. So, I think this this company is very interesting, and uh, it's it's uh, I think it's going to be very successful. <clears throat> well, let me move on. Let so, me ask a question. sure. The impact of AI based algorithms. Right. Um, the impact of AI. Yeah. yeah. So the question is the impact of AI. Well, I think we're going to see it when 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 you look at the uh, at the issue of these. It's big constellations that have tens of thousands of satellites, and you need to prevent satellites from colliding with each other. Even though the still space is pretty big, but ten thousand satellites is a lot. Especially that the, there may be ten thousand from Starlink and ten thousand from another constellation. There is slightly different orbits, but it becomes a very very complicated problem as you can imagine. So that's where where you're going to need something like uh, AI to to manage such such complicated networks. <clears throat> also, the fact that these these constellations become like like a big communication network that happens to be in the sky, and you have all these connectivity issues where you need a lot of intelligence to decide how to route a communication to one point, from one point to another. So, <clears throat> so that's an example. <clears throat> so these are the uh, the RF frequency bands that are uh, common in the SATCOM world. We start as low as uh, one gigahertz or even lower at the, the 900 megahertz L and S band, and there is C band, X, K, U, K, A, and then being developed or deployed right now Q and V band. And this, these are the, the, the frequency bands in, in gigahertz. <clears throat> um, and this is the available bandwidth <clears throat> in, the, in the 80s or so, C band was the big thing. CBAN only has 500 megahertz assignment, but 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 for all of these, when you consider the fact of the polarization that you can do 
circular uh, right hand or left hand or vertical and horizontal, you basically double the capacity. <clears throat> so you can multiply the bandwidth by two for each of these babies. <clears throat> but if you look, for example, K band, you have available basically two gigahertz of bandwidth where you can squeeze in a lot of uh, capacity there. <clears throat> If there are questions, just let me know. Okay. Now, as you can see, I'm I'm uh, computer graphics uh, handicapped, so this is my my kind of graphics. Um, the broadcasting is is a, a perfect application for a geo satellite because you 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 could have let's say one one antenna transmitting, for example, the Super Bowl. You're transmitting the Super Bowl to a satellite, and the satellite may Trans retransmit this whole thing to a, a whole country, a whole continent, or like one third of the surface of the Earth. So it's it's a it's a very nice natural point to multi point connection. You could have thousands or millions of receivers picking up a signal generated by one transmitter, and other other forms of communication don't allow this flexibility. Question. <clears throat> The language is uh, occupied digitally, or well, <clears throat> and that's one of the things that happened in the uh, in the development when I first started in this business. The uh, the, the broadcasting of, of video signals was done with frequency modulation. Uh, so you, you, each tele television channel, a television channel occupies a bandwidth of roughly four megahertz, but when you transmit in FM. It occupied a full transponder, which was 36 megahertz for one channel. <clears throat> so at that time, uh, they used to have a, a satellite would handle 24 channels, and that was it. <clears throat> These days, they, hundred, they handle hundreds of channels because now they go digital, they go compression, they, they go statistical multiplexing, all kinds of things, and then you can squeeze much more capacity in an RF band. <clears throat> This shows an, an, just an example of the uh, the different types of satellites there are and their size. On the left, there is some comparison between satellites and vehicles and stuff. And, and this table here that I got from this reference here, uh, it shows a satellite. The, the biggest satellites are higher than 7,000 kilograms. These are like the size of a school bus, like the, those big satellites. <clears throat> and the... Uh, <clears throat> The satellites like Starlink or so on, they're called small satellites. They're maybe somewhere between 200 and 600 kilograms. And then there's the micro satellites and the CubeSats, things that are the size of a shoebox. So there's a wide range of uh, satellite sizes. And I added this, this figure here that I got somewhere that, that the cost to launch is roughly $3,000 per kilogram. Of course, if you just want to launch a, a shoebox, they're not going to charge you three thousand dollars. This is the aggregate once you combine everything, right? But that's that's roughly the the going rate. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the new the new Leos and what what are the big things about the new Leos? <laughs> um, they have a, an advanced frequency reuse which means they have multiple spot beams to, to cover different areas. Uh, they have digital payloads, which means that in many of these, not in all of them, but in some of them, there is uh, the signal that you transmit to the satellite is actually demodulated and then remodulated and sent to different places. So it's it's a more sophisticated place. The, the traditional satellite has acts more like a repeater, where you send a signal and the satellite, all it does is convert the frequency and retransmit the whole thing. Let's call it a transponder. But uh, in the in the LEOs, there's a much more sophisticated thing also because the LEO satellites are going to talk to each other. It's not just bouncing the signal down to the earth, but if you're going to you're going to have ten thousand of these babies floating in the space. You send a signal to one satellite, and that satellite is going to route the signal to another one, and then to another one, and then figure out the best way to to look for the uh, the download. <clears throat> the uh, Leo's also we're going to use advanced modulation techniques. That means that you can squeeze a lot of bits per hertz uh, <clears throat> to reuse the bandwidth very efficiently. 
Also, one of the big advantages of LEOs is that they have a very low propagation delay. So we talked about the geo is about an eighth of a second in each direction. In uh, LEOs, it's just a few milliseconds, depending on what orbit you're talking about. But if you're comparing 500 kilo kilometers versus 40,000 kilometers. So that's why the, the big differential. The LEO satellites typically have inter-satellite links. And in most cases, these inter-satellite links are optical links. In some cases, it could be RF, but it's a, I think the new thing is the optical links. Uh, the satellites are much lower in volume and much smaller in weight, which means that it's much easier to, and lower cost to, to build and especially to launch. The, the cost of the launch is also, this has always been traditionally a big portion of the cost of the, the satellites. I think some figures that I remember from my earlier times in the satcom world where a, um, a geo satellite would cost, let's say, 200 million or so. But that 200 million consisted of 100 million for the satellite, 50 million for the launch, and 50 million for the insurance. So <clears throat> the launch is always a big portion of, of, the, uh, of the total cost. <clears throat> Okay, so some of the uh, challenges of the LEOs, because now you're going to have satellites that, that move over your, on the in space. You're, you're not going to pull your antenna and, and get the connection because it continues. So you need an antenna that's, that's going to, to steer. Now, the, in, the, in, the, in the new uh, developments, the antenna doesn't mechanically steer and chase the satellite because some antennas do that. But with the, the new technology, it seems that to be very cheap. It's actually a kind of like a flat antenna that happens to steer its beam electronically. So that's a big, big development and big advancement. Um, <clears throat> and these electronically steered antennas, ESAs, <clears throat> they tend to be less efficient than the uh, parabolic dish because the parabolic dish basically has, you have, you have the full gain pointing at the satellite and following it. In a, in a flat uh, uh, steerable antenna, you have the, the geometric issue of lowering the gain when you're pointing uh, sideways. <clears throat> but the electronic steering antenna are definitely more elegant, but much more complex. And there's a lot of R&D into these areas and the mass production of these babies is, is making it uh, affordable. <clears throat> and I showed some slides about a company called Allspace. It used to be called um, isotropic. And uh, I think they have a very nice concept of a steerable antenna. So some of the basic concepts of, of satellites, you see where we are. Uh, you probably heard about the concept of EIRP. This is the effective isotropic radiated power, which is a, is the, is a combination of the, uh, the product of the antenna gain and the, uh, and the transmit power. <clears throat> and these are some basic, parameters that you will see always in SATCOM, EIRP both going up and coming down, because that, that determines how, how strong a signal you're, you're transmitting or you're receiving. And this other concept is also always in, involved in SATCOM, it's called the G over T, which is the ratio of an receive antenna gain to system noise temperature. Uh, it combines the gain of the antenna and the overall noise temperature uh, of the system. And the noise temperature is a combination of sky noise and the LNA noise and the feed losses and all kinds of things. So, but this G over T represents the, uh, the receiving characteristics of, of an antenna. And everybody in the satcom world talks about the G over T. And it's one of the specs that your uh, customer is always going to require for any application. <clears throat> And why is G over T so important? Because if you look at the, at the equation of carrier to noise, you, you obtain the carrier to noise of, 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 a, of a downlink by taking the IRP. This is in the DB land. You take the IRP, you subtract the, the, the propagation loss, and then you add the G over T. So the, C of the carrier to noise ratio is basically proportional to the G over T, because these two parameters you usually don't have much control over. <clears throat> So the better the G over T, the better your C over N, and the C over N is the same as a very equivalent to the EB over N zero in the digital world. So 
this translates directly into the bit error rate of the um, the quality of your digital signal. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so we mentioned that the the traditional satellites have what people call bent pipe transponder or bent pipe architecture, where the signal comes from the surface of the earth to the uh, satellite antenna. <clears throat> no, yeah, this is yeah, this is the satellite antenna. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> The signal comes from the earth to the satellite. This is the receive antenna of the satellite. It goes to a filter, an LNA, then it mixes the signal to a different frequency. In this particular example, we're coming up at six gigahertz. There is an oscillator at 22, 25 megahertz, and the signal comes down exactly the same. It's just being shifted in frequency to the four gigahertz band. So this is, this. they call it band five because it looks like you're sending the signal up and then it just comes down with it. Like if you bend the pipe. <clears throat> yes. Is this a budget link or that's it's a national issue or EV or G? Is it day and night or is there any adjustment for day and night? Well, the U over T, it doesn't change much between day and night. It, it may change very slightly, depending on the frequency band and depending on the atmospheric conditions, there may be some slight discrepancy. <laughs> now, different from the then pipe satellites, they have some, some satellites that have an architecture where they have a regeneration. And I mentioned before, where you, you receive the signal, <clears throat> You actually demodulate the signals, then you do some processing or switching, you modulate again, you go to the transmitters, and, and then you send the signal to either to the next satellite or to the down to the earth. Um, now, these are more the, the, the problem with these satellites that are regenerative is that they are specific to the signals that you're being transmitted, whereas the band type satellite. Is very useful because whatever you send up is going to be sent down. You don't have to worry about whether it's QPSK, eight, eight phase, 64 QM, or whatever. In this case, your signal has to, to accommodate whatever is in the on the satellite as far as the, the DMOD and the coders and decoders. <laughs> uh, I'm going to skip on this one. Um, and this is an example of how you calculate the efficiency of a Cassegrain antenna. Cassegrain is the parabolic antenna that has a, uh, a feed here in the middle of the, uh, the vertex and the uh, subreflector. <clears throat> so, um, so just to give you an, an, an example, the, the, uh, the efficiency of an antenna is uh, ideally should be 100%, but in practice, it's always less than 100%. In this particular example, it's more like 68%. And where do the inefficiencies come from? The illumination efficiency, the subreflector spillover, because you, you have this parabolic bouncing and not everything falls on the, on the um, reflector. You have some losses due to blockage and some other losses internal to the feed or whatever. So a typical antenna is going to have an, an efficiency somewhere between 60 and 70% of the ideal. <clears throat> and this is a parabolic antenna. <clears throat> I think we saw something similar, so let me skip on that one. This item is uh, pretty something that I, 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 I involve very dearly because it has to do with the fact that the satellite has two resources that are basically worth your money. They call it the satellite is a big thing, and but the thing that, that collects money is what they call the payload, which is the communication portion of the satellite. And that's and that payload has two characteristics that you're going to exploit. This, the power and the bandwidth. You have those two elements. And sometimes the two elements play in op op opposite directions. So you, if you're trying to transmit a signal to a very small dish, you're going to need more power. <clears throat> if you have a big dish, you're going to need less power. So <clears throat> the question is, where, where do you draw the line for balancing the power and the bandwidth of the satellite so that you don't waste 
power of waste bandwidth. <clears throat> and and, and I show this, this is a, a equivalent in transportation. If you transport, if you have a cargo truck, it's humongous, but it's limited in, in weight. You, you can either fill the truck with a lot of light stuff or put a lot of heavy stuff, but half of the space is going to be empty. So you try to to achieve a uh, situation where you can fill the truck with stuff and, and reach the capacity in terms of its weight. <clears throat> so that's equivalent to the satellite being in, in uh, balance between the, its power and its bandwidth. <clears throat> uh, this plot is a typical, we call the uh, waterfall curves of the, of the, the, the DMOD performance. This is the probability of error of the signal, and this is the EV over N0, which is equivalent to the carrier to noise ratio for different modulation schemes and uh, that have various levels of efficiency. <clears throat> As I mentioned, with the new satellites, they have um, a uh, modulation scheme that's very efficient, something like 64 QAM, which means that you have, you have um, Eight, eight bits per symbol, and the constellation of, of your, of your uh, signal is such that the, the magnitude and the vector has 64 different positions <clears throat> where, um, <clears throat> and, and you achieve a high uh, efficiency of how many bits per second you can transmit in a given amount of, of, of our bandwidth. So these plots are very useful to to determine where, where you're gonna be when you do your calculations. And, and this shows the efficiency for different modulation schemes. Um, there is a, a, a measure of um, channel characteristic that's called, that's become very much in uh, use these days. It's called the error vector magnitude instead of the bit error rate. Now this one basically measures the position of your receive signal uh, on the, um, the vector space uh, relative to to what it's supposed to be. So this is the power, the error, the error signal. This is the power, and this is the the uh, the phase. And, and so instead of measuring the bit error rate, you measure how far off from the uh, desired bit state uh, or state of the of the constellation you're going to be relative to its uh, reference. So it's it's a percentage, and again it's. These days, uh, people try to, to use this, this uh, measurement instead of bit error rate. The downside is that in order to do this, you're, you're taking into account not only the mod, and the, but also the, uh, the linearity performance of your channel, which would be the amplifier, LNA, and so on. <clears throat> anyway. Let's see how we go with time. Let me... This was just an example of the evolution of television broadcasting. You may remember those of us that are pretty old, that people used to have humongous antennas in their backyard to receive television, like, you know, 15 feet. <laughs> and these days you have something like this. And what, why is the, the, uh, the evolution? Um, the satellites have higher power, um, the antennas are more efficient, the modulation is better, they use digital modulation, they use different frequency bands, again. So, so all, all those factors combined allow you to go from this monster to this. And these are still not too desirable in some cases, but uh, um, I, I put a note here at the bottom, as you, as you, I hear some commercials on TV where DirecTV is offering their service without a satellite dish. So we're coming to the point that the satellite vendor is offering a service for video without even a dish. <laughs> of course, that has to do with the uh, the fact that you do streaming. But uh, again, so this is hitting a little bit on the, uh, the broadcasting uh, service uh, business. The business of both dish and direct TV is going down because of, of this fact. <clears throat> I want to skip these two. These are some uh, specifics on KA band. So let me let me move on. Mm -hmm. The high throughput satellites. So the, the, these are the big satellites that have a lot of flexibility and a lot of capacity. So what they do is 
they they have like all these spots which are shown here in different colors. And when you have two spots with the same color, that means that they're in the same frequency. So they they basically divide the frequency of the satellite in, in, in a few chunks, and then they they spread the, the, the bandwidth amongst all these different spots. So there's a lot of reusage of a satellite. That's, that's how they can achieve um, capacities of 100 gigabit per second or so. Whereas in a traditional satellite, you would only achieve maybe a few gig gigabit per second. So, uh, but this requires very complicated satellites, very complicated multiple beam forms in the satellite, big, big power. Humongous satellites, very expensive, but but these are definitely um, still very useful. This shows the difference between a typical satellite and a high to satellite by dividing the footprint. Okay, so let's go to some of the new <clears throat> new satellites. As I mentioned, there is this company called Astranis. They started about I don't know eight years ago or so. I remember meeting them at some of the satellite conferences. So they, they call their satellite a micro-geo. I would call it more like a mini-geo, as you can see it here. It's not that small, but it's much smaller than, than the, the school bus, uh, somewhere between 400 to 600 kilograms. So they're much lighter than a, than a geo, but much lower cost. And they use for both commercial and military applications. <clears throat> so, uh, they, so let's say a, a country wants to have a, a geosatellite, but they don't want to spend two, $300 million. So they, they can buy one of these and, uh, and have capacity that only covers their particular country. So uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a useful concept. And they have te some technical uh, developments that they did themselves. They created a, what we call a software-defined radio. So the satellite is not the old fashioned with all these channels and but it it's, it has it can be configured by software <laughs> and um, and also it's just in house design semiconductor. So I don't know exactly what what that would be, but so they uh, they basically spend a lot of time in, in developing this new technology. This company has about two hundred people or so and they're in San Francisco. <laughs> Sorry. How big can the uh, antenna be from the spacecraft? In other words, to, to have a smaller spot. Otherwise, I'm not sure if they can, they they can steer the beam or or not. I'm, I'm really not sure. Are they very high frequency? No, I think they're right at K band. Because yeah. mm -hmm. they're the new band 70, 75, 80, 85. Oh, the Q and B then? That work is approved, but I don't know anybody that's using it. Yeah, I know these people. I think this this is K event. So, but I'm not sure. They don't disclose much of their technology. That's the problem with some of these systems. Yeah, that you just get a little bit of the. You just get a little bit of the ground here. You're gonna get the papers. You wanna need something? Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I thought it's it's a new nice concept, but yeah, the details are not very really clear. <laughs> yeah. Now, this other company, which used to be called Isotropic Systems, they developed these uh, antennas that have that are steer steerable, electronically steerable. So, um, and and so in, in 2019, they announced that they they tested this thing in a K event satellite. They have internally, and again, I don't understand the details, but they call it optical beam forming technology, which is what happens in here. So, it's the form of a planar Luber. Sorry? It's the form, it's in the form of planar Luber lens. Oh, okay. Planar Luber lens, that's what uh, Frank mentioned. <clears throat> so, um, and, 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 and if you look at their, at their site, they they have this is actually I took a, a shot of this screen. So depending on what geo vertical you want or what EIRP you need, because these are both transmit and receive antennas, then then the configuration of the antenna varies. So you can or you have more more antennas, and they activate different parts of these antennas depending on the geo vertical. So if you look at the site and go through, it, this is actually a video, not a, a, a it, in their site is a video. So if you move the G over T down, you can see that you, you may only need two of these dishes or only one or only a portion of the dish. So, so they're basically adjust their, their, 
this the configuration of the antenna based on your requirements. <clears throat> I, assuming that these are not dirt cheap, I have no idea how much they are, but they, 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 they look beautiful <clears throat> as far as their, their functionality. And here's how the antenna is configured with the different layers. Uh, okay, so now we go to some of these Leo constellations. Okay, so let me, let me skip Global Star. Uh, Iridium is a good, ex it's, it's a nice example because these people started in the 90s. They went back bankrupt in the late 90s and they were about to die and somebody managed to rescue them. And they're still in business and they're actually a profitable business now. And they, their um, the, the main objective is provide uh, low data and phone connectivity to uh, like cell phones kind of thing. <clears throat> Um, and this is an example of these networks that, that are developed because it was technically a, a beauty, I think, in my opinion. <laughs> it was a technical beauty, but they didn't think of the marketing thing of it because they spent billions of dollars developing this. The constellation consists of 66 satellites wow. in different planes to cover many portions of the, of the world. And I remember that their advertisement consisted of showing somebody in the middle of the desert on a camel with a telephone. Mm -hmm. Okay, big deal, but how many of those do you sell? Uh, and, and, and at that time, the cell phone industry started developing and Iridium would cost you $10 a minute to make a phone call or 20, and the cell phones were obviously much cheaper, so their, bus their business plan completely went under. And... Um, and I know there is a, uh, I put a note here, there is a book, I remember reading this a few years, called Eccentric Orbits, where they tell the story of this whole thing. It, it's very interesting, because this $60 billion thing, somebody bought for a few million dollars and basically made, uh, resurrected the whole business and, and made it uh, profitable. And now they have what's called Iridium Next, which has this nice antenna with, uh, K band and feeder links and, and cross links. <laughs> now we go to Starlink, which is what a colleague here was asking. So at this point, they have um, they have approximately six thousand satellites in orbit right now. But every week you hear that they launch some more, so the number keeps on changing. Uh, now where is it going to stop? You hear different stories. It could be 8,000, 12,000, 30,000, who knows? But they, I think the, the FCC allowed them to go to a very high number. So they keep on growing and growing and growing. They offer this, the, um, this is what, what the constellation looks like, the different planes, the different orbits. <clears throat> and as mentioned, there is a lot of um, issues about the fact that there's, there's a lot of satellites up there. The astronomers are complaining about interference and uh, blockage and stuff. Um, but they have very, very nice thing. This is a picture of this, the, a bunch of satellites. They, they, they launched 60 satellites at a time. So this is actually 60 satellites here in this structure. They launch those 60 satellites, then they, they send them into their orbit. And, it, and you may have seen something like this in the sky. I have not seen it, but I've seen a lot of pictures. And because they launch out of Vandenberg here. So sometimes you can actually see these things. Uh, so this is after the launch, they, they seem to be on a line, but eventually they go to their corresponding orbit and then they, they do the tricks. <clears throat> and this shows how they put a whole bunch of these satellites on the, on the fairing of the uh, rockets. The other thing that SpaceX did, as you know, the fact that they can reuse their rockets. They, they launch a satellite and then they bring them down, which was a very um, innovative thing that they came up with. And here I found some numbers for the Starlink uh, services. So the basic service, you have to pay 600 bucks for the terminal and something like $120 a month. Again, that's the basic. So it's, again, it's not, you're not gonna sell this in the Amazon jungle, but. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the other thing that they do have, and slide here, 
think they have currently, okay, here it is. They have more than 3 million subscribers. So they're doing pretty well. So despite, they, they have invested a lot of money, but they're actually, as far as I understand, they're actually, um, they may actually be doing money, I'm not sure. <laughs> Now, the one that's going to come to have here the, the architecture, this is what the antenna looks like. Uh, you have to point it in a certain direction, but again, then, then you, the, the, the antenna has a beam that basically steers and, and picks up the different satellites as they move on. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice beauty. This is some how the electronic and steer antenna works. This is a typical face array. Um, so let's talk about Kuiper because we're running out of time. So Kuiper is also a Leo constellation, not as many as, as Starlink. This one is only gonna have something like 3,200 satellites, whereas Starlink may have 20,000 or however many it is. The altitude is fairly similar, 600 kilometers. It's owned by Amazon. They, somebody estimated the value of 10 billion. So that's what it takes if you want to develop your own constellation. Um, the Blue Origin Company, which is also owned by Amazon, but it's a separate company. So Kuiper does not only depend on Blue Origin, but they're going to use Blue Origin. So, but they use launches by Ariane, ULA, SpaceX, and you. So they actually use a competition for the launches. <laughs> The data rates are gonna go somewhere between 100 and up to 1,000 megabit per service, per second. Um, now, I think these guys, they're, they're like three years behind Starlink, but Amazon, as you know, everybody in the world seems to use Amazon. So I think they have that advantage of, of being a household name in worldwide, basically. So I think they're most likely gonna be a very successful thing. This is what their antenna looks like. These people were smart enough to put a picture of a bird next to it so you can figure out the size of the antenna. Um, the satellites, uh, Kuiper has been very secretive about the satellites. So nobody has actually seen a satellite, but this is the satellite inside the crate. <clears throat> and that's why in this picture here, somebody took a picture of the satellite actually in the sky and that's what it looks like. <laughs> but uh, Kuiper has not shown pictures of the actual satellite or showing any details of how, what the satellite uh, is like. But this is the launch of their, their Kuiper. And to finish, I'm gonna talk just a few seconds about the satellite, the uh, Internet of Things. There is several players in the market. Here I saw a list. And the one that caught my attention is this company called Satel IoT. I don't know how they pronounce it. I think this company is based in Spain. Uh, and they, they integrate uh, cell phones <clears throat> with the satellite network. So this is like a 5G constellation in space. They currently have two satellites in orbit and more are coming. So, but, but the big guys are playing in this business, Iridium, Global Star, um, Telesat, Utilsat. Um, and the idea is to, to connect, uh, the IoT will use very low data rate. So this is very different from, from the other ones. So th these are very small terminals. They operate maybe a, a few kilobits per second because that's all they need. And that you can use for, um, you know, like monitoring networks, like what used to be called SCADA or those kinds of applications <clears throat> or connecting things like connecting your refrigerator to the internet. <clears throat> uh, and this is the, the estimated satellite IoT market. Uh, it's actually not that small. They're talking about something like uh, 4 billion in this year and growing up to 10 billion. <clears throat> oh my God, we didn't talk about space debris. So we, we're going to be running out of time. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, so uh, there, there are several institutions that are concerned about space debris and they're doing something about it. And there's some uh, guidelines that have been produced and in international conferences. Um, the idea is that these low Earth orbit satellites, when their life expires, which is about five years or so, they're going to go into uh, basically burn in the atmosphere. Now, what does that do to people? So let's hope nothing, but uh, that's why people are concerned. <clears throat> um, uh, 
All right, so this is my last slide. So I say that uh, the, the challenges for the new systems are, <clears throat> if you want to develop your own system or a new constellation, you need to get regulatory approval in each country that you're going to land. So that's a main task, a big challenge, because you, you don't just post your satellite and you can land anywhere you want. You need to get regulatory approvals in different countries. <clears throat> the spectrum availability is an issue because there's not so much spectrum available. And you have to fight with the ITU. You have to have a deorbit plan and a space debris management. And your system, like uh, this uh, colleague of us was asking on the AI, you need to have a system that avoids collisions. And uh, there's so many things in space that some of them may not be another constellation, but maybe actual debris from previous satellites that burned or whatever. Uh, and you need to have, the satellites have to be flexible enough to do maneuvers to avoid collisions. <clears throat> but then again, you need to do a maneuver such that you're not going to collide with somebody else. So it becomes a pretty complicated problem. <clears throat> Um, and I, my, last, my last comment here is you, you have to pay attention to the ground systems. I know the, the space system seems to be more glamorous. It's a very sexy and very nice. But in the end, what makes the system work properly and uh, profitable yeah. is to have the proper ground system that matches that thing. And that's why some of these companies like OneWeb, O3B, Iridium, all of those companies went bankrupt, and some of them managed to resuscitate, but some others went just went under because they didn't take into account the whole equation. <clears throat> okay, that's basically what I got. Okay. <clears throat> uh, on the starting satellite, why is it the lifetime is only five years? That is, they design them like that because they usually they it's usually the the, the fuel in the satellite that that uh, determines the life of a satellite. So the solar panels are not sufficient to provide power. But probably not. Also, in this world, uh, and especially people like uh, Starlink. Right now, even if you look at those six thousand satellites, they're not all the same. They started with some smaller satellites, now they're a little bigger, now they have more functionality. Now some satellites have direct to cell connection. So the technology changes so much that these people don't want to keep the satellite longer than five years. So it's both a technological drive, and I believe, I assume it's the uh, the fuel that limits. The, the, the fuel satellites, <clears throat> that the electronics is exposed to a lot of radiation, uh, solar radiation and so forth, and that has a lifetime of 15 years. Right, right. And the light limiting factor there is actually the solar panels. And NASA had a program uh, to um, basically rejuvenate the solar panels by shining laser beam on the panel and wiping out the last layer wow. of the of the silicon. Coming to the moon. I don't know what happened to that program, not anywhere or not, but. Uh, well, I know that the, my understanding was that the, the life limitation was on the fuel, on the station keeping, but maybe the solar panels also did great. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a few companies that actually offer the service of, of uh, renewing or remodeling satellites. So they actually send send this probe and they and they either refuel the satellite or they change some of the things that they can change and they actually do that. So some some companies do that for debris collection and some people do it for uh, upgrades or to to extend the call life extension services. The other the other big contributor to the life is battery. You know, the Sorry, is what batteries? Because it's not radio. Fields, say a 98 minute orbit, mm -hmm. and that's in the dark. So the solar panels were great for the but on the side when the sun's out, they have to recharge the batteries because they have to they have to provide service, and that payload has to move information in the dark for the other 45 minutes. <laughs> and then geos have the eclipse cycle. So they have to have batteries or a general right. seer, they go out for um, an hour a deep day. In the dark, in the geodark station, it is not perfect. Yes. I think it's not a problem, but I don't think 
So even the geos have batteries, and so those batteries aren't used much, mm -hmm. but they are when they go out, they go out and they have to stay. Well, from what she's what she was saying, it's yeah, just uh, I've heard from most that the power we're talking about is not that. just the fault, and it's just the uh, uh, what we need to run the electronic communication systems and everything else, and uh. There comes solar panels. I think the satellites are also meant to be very low cost. I can use the parts, you can use commercial parts. That's another point. So I think that's a business plan. As soon as the satellites are going to be only for five years and they're going to have to replenish them. So it's part of the equation. So so the, the, the generation of trash is it's unavoidable and, and, and it is it's a big issue. I think in all of this, the bigger issue is really the debris that all these are generated in, in space. Yeah. And it makes it very unsafe for. Yeah, that's not what I want. Space is good. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. What? No, no. Oh. What was the question? Yes, the geosatellites they have a. They have a. Mm -hmm. They can replace the central dimension so knowing that the silos have the bandwidth limited capacity. Are they eventually no. going to be replacing cell towers? You think so? No, I don't think so. I think that I think the geo satellites are going to continue forever. Well not forever, but for the next few decades. Can somebody fix their hand solve it? How do we I think uh, I guess they can unmute themselves and then speak into their way. We should be able to hear you. Who's the person who raised it? Oh, oh, they send. Doctor okay. Nosadal, can you hear me? Yeah, no, yeah, now I can hear you. So Excellent. Somebody... <clears throat> yes, Doctor Nosadal, question. The yeah. I like I, I, SpaceX will be bringing down in about eighteen months the cost to launch. To of uh, 200, excuse me, 100 metric tons for 20 million dollars. That's a launch cost of 200 dollars per kilogram. Can okay. you spec 200 dollars a kilogram is 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 uh, uh, shaky, is earth shaking in this industry in the uh, launch industry? Can you speculate what it means that you don't have to really be concerned about the weight of your satellite? You don't have to go out for exotic metals, super duper PhDs to get rid of every ounce, every gram on the spacecraft because it's so cheap to launch. What opportunities? My question is, what do you think might be new opportunities, not the ones you've already discussed, that that will enable because the launch costs are so low, satellites can be huge. They can just be slapped together because they're so inexpensive to launch. Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> I, I open it. So, so, no, she's, he's talking about the fact that the, the cost of launches is, is decreasing very dramatically because of SpaceX. Mm -hmm. That's down to, I forget what you said, $200. $200 uh, so per said, kilogram, yes. What opportunities does that bring? Because you, can, you may not have to worry so much about you know, watching every gram of your satellite. So that, that was a, the open question. Right. Right. So, so, yeah. So, one one of our uh, colleagues here says that you can use that to combine more payloads and in, in the launch. But and I think it opens many possibilities. Uh, I don't know if, if you if you have some ideas because uh, I. <clears throat> I think it is that's open some some possibilities. So what do you think? One idea that comes to mind immediately is being able to armor satellites against space debris, since the again remember that's a whole new paradigm. You don't have to be concerned about every single gram or ounce. You can put she you can put armor plating on your satellite to defend against uh space uh debris. That's that opens up um it reduces the fear that everybody has that it's going to become unusable. Space will become unusable because of space debris. 
Well, if you have three inches of steel protecting your satellite or, or the equivalent thereof in, in high-tech material, I think that helps a lot. What do you think? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not probably the right person to answer, but in my opinion, the, uh, the space collision, may, even if you have an armored satellite, I think it's going to, to break it apart. But and that's my, my intuition. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think I think uh, my understanding is that to avoid collision, they're going to start doing ma maneuvers to to avoid that. So the the positive thing is that they are monitoring all that, not all that, but it, every space debris larger than the this size is being monitored by some people, so that they know when a potential collision may occur. So you need to maneuver the satellite. But but I think but what you say, it's I think it it. Uh, it will have an impact on the overall cost of the uh, of the constellations because if the launch starts getting cheaper, uh, I think that it's it's a significant portion of the overall cost of a of a network. I think that actually will worsen the problem of jumping the space because people will launch all sorts of things because it's uh, affordable now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First thing you said. Okay, okay, one more question. When you say ROG satellite, mm -hmm. what is the major difference with the generic? Oh, it's a very small satellite since they handle very low capacity. To, for the coverage issue? Because because they have, uh, they try to serve, you know, connections of a few kilobits per second, mm -hmm. as opposed to hundreds of megabits per second on the big satellite. So so the IoT satellites can be very small, like a you know, like a CubeSat kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that that's a difference. But I think that many of the IoT uh, operators are going to use conventional satellites, just make use of the spectrum mm -hmm. and offer if if you have a very smart little terminal that costs only 200 bucks or so, you can connect these in many places and have a service. Mm -hmm. I have a question about them um, connecting your cell phone directly to satellite. Right. Because you're sure that you're going to start and you can have like, like a hand. What's the so what's the future or the possibility of you know, using my cell phone directly, you know, talking to somebody else or you know, as far as I understand that is feasible these yeah. days already. But the uh, whole you feel is the yeah, I was like, how do you deal with the sort of this meeting? What size of a camera do you If I want to get back with some of you. There's already the new iPhone. Yeah. Next generation, they already have SOS, which is mm -hmm. the one which is new. Mm -hmm. They already have communication to send. Yeah, they started this launch next week, so we can set on the website that 24 of the satellites had. Has cells so directly to the satellite, yeah. Now that, that cell phone capability isn't 5G, it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, it's, I don't know how many bits per second, but it does work. It's an SOS. It is as like an emergency, yes, but it's exactly. not for communication. So right, right, exactly. That's the idea. And this other company that I showed there, they yeah. called AST. But because AT and T and AST made an, an agreement, yes. And I think when when the AST guy is talking, he's saying. That they're using cell phones like that, no, mm -hmm. not 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 uh, specially designed phones. I, yeah, but that's only for special purpose uh, communication. Like right. SOS and, uh, so essentially, from sort of a basic science point of view, you really you don't have technology that allows you to use cell phone to talk to satellite at a high level. I don't know what they when they yeah. have that capability. Yes, they have a lot. Of Spatial and energy in the space. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that small. You're, you're talking about space array from the satellite? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. all technically possible. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. they can now. But people, people are, because Leo is so much closer, it's not usable. It's not yeah. It's not yeah, I think the law has to be already demonstrated that he was able to make a video call from the real world to the spiral satellite that's picked up with the American So, you think that some of these are very high? Yeah, I'm not sure what the big budget is, but 
obviously they have crazy layers of the satellites and satellites yeah. with different yeah. 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 Sorry. What's always been amazing about Mm -hmm. so we started the Hubble Desk in 96, and then went to Celestrian, and then that those went up there, and then Iridium got eaten up by the cell phones. This is now finally happening. And um, you're eliminating the last mile, which for over 150 years has been at and t mm -hmm. The connections are out. Mm -hmm. They just asleep. Are they just not participating? I don't understand how they're going. Going to give up all the cable companies, all the people that are doing the internet connection to the house right now, the fiber. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned that we don't get the delay through the satellite or phone calls like we used to 25 years ago, it's because of fiber. It's not, mm -hmm. because, it's not because of anything else. Mm -hmm. Only fiber can get you that kind of uh, reduction in latency. Right. Uh, so I don't understand exactly the people that are providing the fiber today. I just see your list of big players. Mm -hmm. You don't see Comcast, you don't see right. you don't see you don't see, you don't see Verizon. Right. Who provide all the connection for every cell phone and every and every uh cop spot in their house, every every router that's right now. Yes, Musk has had this the Starlink is taking over in certain areas of the world. Right, and I think eventually those big carriers are going to absorb many of these kinds of things. going to be 20 years ago, 15 years ago. You can get a terminal for wide blue from the use, which had a KA band connection to a geo satellite, which you didn't get in your house. It was a lot of time. Which, if you were in northern Canada, or not going to go too far north into the geo, but you know what I'm saying? You could be in a remote area. So I'm just curious where the old, the old big players are. Right. <laughs> Even though the AT&T is one of the biggest companies in the world. <laughs> well, it is kind of social good. So yeah. This is the company. Most of the stuff. This is the technology. Thank you. Okay, I think you need to. I just want to present you with a uh, oh. you know, appreciation for your outstanding uh, oh. speaker for the uh, chapter. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. 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 Yeah, so thanks again uh, for staying to uh, answer all those questions from our uh, audience. Obviously, it was very uh, a lot of interest in this topic. Uh, so just a quick announcement for future. You can see uh, if you're local, I guess if you're uh, interested, there's going to be a series of uh, workshops by uh, one of our high school members named uh, Ms. Sanas. Sarkras, who's a sort of a robotics expert. So she set up these workshops so that you can learn how to basically develop your own robotic application on your own laptop. So basically you have to bring your laptop and show you how to set up everything, a platform where you can sort of develop a robotic type of uh, simulations or applications. So that's it uh, for today. And I thank uh, you know, everybody for coming. Thanks for all the different uh, people who helped out, you know, um, Sahin and Andre, for helping us reserve this uh, classroom, the for getting all the food and speaker and preparing, and the audience for your questions and participation. So, thanks again. I hope I uh, see you in the near future. Thank okay. you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.